Okay, thank you, Denise. Um, and first of all, I just want to, uh, you know, say hello to Jane here, who's who's was been a, a, a most uh, inspiring of uh, PhD supervisors and, and not just the supervisors, actually. She's kind of got me interested in a whole bundle of things, even post post PhD. And some of some of the interests, particularly uh, that she shares are that that of kinship and um, morphology and um, also uh, child language acquisition. And I thought I would and, and these are, you know, try to fit all these kind of things together. So, um, not this is a very slow to emerge stuff coming out of my decra. So I thought I might offer it up for the for the fest trip. Um, okay. Firstly, I also just like to uh, acknowledge the Ngunnawal owners of the country, but also also the sort of twenty odd clans of the Thumbara region of uh, Western NT and the caregivers and the very small emerging leaders of Wadir. Um, so in the children's book by P.D. Eastman, the learning problem for the bird who emerges from his shell alone is to establish which of the entities he encounters is his mother. And being a sort of standard average European type of bird, uh, he really needs to only settle on one bird because mother is a standard English kinship in kinship designates but a single individual. Um, that's essentially because mother in standard English is a descriptive uh, kin term, which can be distinguished from uh, classificatory kin, ter kin terms like uncle that collapse blood relatives and relatives by marriage within the same basket. And all Australian kinship systems can be thought of as uh, extremely classificatory or universal effectively. And in Wadia, there are about sort of 17 kin terms that could be extended out across the whole community. And such that the words you might use for your mother, gale or mama can be extended to literally hundreds of people. Um, learning kinship is perhaps a bit like learning to read in it, it can take years to become competent and with expertise developing over a lifetime. And every individual has their own genealogy. And for children, these genealogies are like isolated trees. And like that bird, kids have to sort of climb down one tree and then sort of walk to the next, if you like. But somehow they learn not only their own genealogies, but those of their peers. And as they uh, gain agility, they can perhaps get from one tree to the next more rapidly, kind of like flying like a bird does. And these isolated genealogies then become like a lattice or a network. And once you can read the network of classificatory relationships, you have access to the sort of encyclopedic knowledge of the community. And perhaps the most unexpected outcome of this research is that actual birds are co-opted into the procedural learning of classificatory kinship, at least so it seems. I here adopt a kind of polysemic analysis of kinship classificatory kin terms where a broader kinship category like nothan may be extended from a sort of prototypical or focal relationship type like, like brother via abstract sort of merging procedures. Although, although these are usually described as abstract equations, uh, within uh, interaction, participants actually engage in merging procedures in order to explain how uh, people are related to each other. And the really, the really key one, it seems, is same-sex sibling merger, which essentially just treats uh, same uh, siblings of the same sex as equivalent. So your father's brother is just another is another father rather than being an uncle, so to speak. Okay, um, I'll give you a bit of an example, a, a quick one that. A simplified version. Uh, in this was from a conversation. Dave and Bruce here are classificatory brothers, and Dom had been talking about his girlfriend Trixie, uh, which is her nickname. And Bruce didn't really know who she was talking about, so Dom tells her that her English name is Trisha. Um, and they 
they explain to Bruce that she should, she should call Bruce Kaka, mother's brother. And they do this by invoking another bloke, Henry, who both Bruce and Dave called Nata, brother, and who Tricia should call Kaka, mother's brother. He, so he's effectively the linking relative. And they effectively treat the... They effectively treat the, relation, the three classificative brothers relationships as though they were actual brothers demonstrating why Trisha should in theory call Bruce Kaka. Um, so I'm sort of drawing on a paper that came out a couple of couple of years ago uh, that I've done with various colleagues including Jeremiah Tunmuk up in Wadia and and this was sort of experimental and and the up the up shot of this is basically that genealogically distant kin are more difficult to classify than close kin and that same-sex sibling merger actually seems to uh, minimize the cognitive demand on both children and adults alike effectively reducing the burden of genealogical distance shrinking it down into something more manageable and same-sex sibling merger provides a kind of genealogical shortcut that allows kids a sort of fast passage through the forest of genealogical relationships. So from here, we're really interested in how children learn, and I'm drawing on the, on the LAMP corpus, and thank, thanks to uh, Bill Forshaw and Lucy Davison for their uh, wonderful, amazing corpus that they've combined, compiled. Um, so the first thing to say actually about this is that we can forget all about the poverty of the stimulus here. In interaction, both kin terms and kin tax is ubiquitous and very, very frequent indeed. Okay, every, you know, 50 seconds, whatever, 15 seconds for some things. We've got a, um, we've pulled from this 639 tokens of mama, which is basically 39% of all, all tokens. So this is all over the place. Um, kin terms have been in int of interest to psychologists because they're deactic shifters, they can be anchored onto different people. And many of the sort of uh, studies that sort of rep replicate Piaget's methods um, points to sort of four developmental stages, uh, a pre-categorical stage where a name is, uh, kin terms kind of like a name. The categorical stage is the one we're most interested in here. This is where a child overgeneralizes some kind of semantic feature like age or gender and extends the term like mother to say women in general or to adults or something like this. Then we get so, sort of more like a, a regular type of kin term, but it's, but it's only unidirectional. And finally you get a sort of reciprocal stage. But as I said, it's this, it's this stage two that we're most interested in here. In this talk, all of the participants come from this one particular genealogy. So most of the caregivers in the in extracts are either sisters or cousins. So similarly, all of the children are either siblings or cousins. So the female caregivers are either mothers or aunties. So the question is, how do kids know who is who? So if a, a, sta a categorical stage two child that overgeneralizes the classificatory term mama will quite often produce the term correctly, more often than an English speaking child who overgeneralizes the English term mummy. So do kids then receive uh, feedback that, that they need to use to refine these sort of emerging kinship categories? Um, it seems they do in, in, of, of, in a fashion, yes. So in this extract, Tanya is making a, a little shelter out of grass uh, and her daughter, with her daughter, Emily, and niece, Acacia. And Acacia addresses Tanya as mama, uh, which Tanya then promptly corrects. <laughs> Oh, 
Binti Burbele, Minokada Chalvo. Okay, so at line eight, Acacia tells Tanya to put something down, maybe a leaf or something, and she addresses Tanya as mama. And at line 10, she firstly points out that she's not Acacia's mama, and then adds at line 13 that uh, she should really say Pippi, auntie. Note that this is not a straightforward auntie relationship, okay? There are basically two types of sibling merger here. Uh, you can see fathers, mothers, sisters, daughter, okay? Contracted down to father, sister. Um, so although the terminological equivalence of same-sex siblings is not here foregrounded, this all still has to be learned and Acacia's just effectively received one of her first lessons in classificative kinship. So a stage two child that overgeneralizes a kin term is corrected for their mistake, has the opportunity to reset the extension of these emerging proto category by eliminating that person from the set of persons that they can use that particular kin term for. And if they're provided with an alternative term, they'll learn a new person to kin term mapping that's appropriate for them. But a stage two child prone to overgeneralization that picks the correct relevant term, do they receive positive feedback that they might help, to help them to calibrate the boundaries of these emerging proto-categories? And probably not much, it seems. And I've got the, my nicest piece of data that sort of speaks to this, I would never fit into a 20 minute talk. So I'm gonna skate on th through that, unfortunately. <coughs> But um, I want to press on to some of the sorts of prompting routines that sort of illustrate how, how they teach, basically. Caregivers prompt young children to say what to whom, and some of these prompts include child-anchored kin terms mapped onto the names of known relatives. And the evidence is that, these, that young kids they don't fully, clearly don't fully understand what they're saying, but nevertheless, these sorts of prompts are drilled in, drilled into them and, and to and drills into them that they produce the appropriate kin terms from their own point of view. And the, uh, you'll see here that the anchoring of kin terms is supported by both points and gaze. Um, now in this part of the country, uh, one's clan totems are regarded as one's siblings. And in this extract, Tanya hears the sound of a whistling kite, which is uh, her daughter's clan totem. And in this prompting routine, Tanya tells Emily to tell the whistling kite what to say to her grandmother, who's nearby fishing. Okay, so hearing the sound of the whistling kite at line three, uh, Tanya uh, instructs her daughter Emily at line five to tell the kite uh, to tell the kite that the fish belongs to Karen, which she then does. And, and Tanya adds an addendum at line nine that, it, that informs the kite about Emily's relationship to Karen, which is dutifully repeated by Emily at line 11. Then at lines 13 and 14, and then again at lines 16 and 18, Tanya via Emily instructs the kite what to say to Karen. Importantly, 
at line 20, Tanya instructs Emily to address the kite as Ngata, brother, which he does at line 22. At line 34, she tells Emily to tell Acacia to call out to, presumably to the kite, which Emily complies with. And this routine is then repeated at lines 36 and 37. Then, then Acacia does as instructed by calling out to the kite. You call out! <laughs> this classification of Clan totems with siblings probably provides a kind of developmental anchor for children in that we've suddenly shifted the kinship domain from a sort of concrete genealogical base where kin terms are linked to people's names to a more abstract basis where totems occupy the same structural positions within the kinship structure as people. After all, if your totems are your siblings, then your mother's clan totems are your mother's, and, you, and your grandmother's totems are your grandmother's, and so on. In this extract, Emily and Adam are parallel cousins, and thus siblings, and they have different fathers and different fathers' mothers. Nevertheless, both maternal grandmothers are from the same clan, and this clan has Kutek, the red-tailed black cockatoo, as a totem. And when the three sisters, Tanya, Penelope, and Lauren, hear the red-tailed black cockatoo, they begin teaching them about their paternal grandmothers. Emily's direct, direct paternal grandmother, or her maka, is Belinda, but Adam has a different maternal grandmother, Wendy. Nevertheless, he can still call Belinda maka and vice versa because Lauren and Tanya are sisters. And these are the mergers that are involved uh, in this particular extract. Makka, <laughs> Okay, so at line one, Penelope notices the kangaroo, then uh, the cockatoo, then addressing Adam at line three, Penelope points up into the tree and asserts that his father's mother, Wendy, is over there. Then at line seven, she again points up into the tree and it asserts that his paternal grandmother is over there. In each case, the kin term is covertly anchored onto Adam. At line eight, Adam initiates repair by proffering a candidate understanding of the reference, Makangai, my paternal grandmother, uh, at line 10, Penelope neither confirms his understanding as being correct, which it is, nor refutes it for being incorrect. Instead, she explicitly anchors the same kin term onto both Adam and Emily with the second person dual sibling inflected possessive pronoun Nungu, your two siblings Maka, with, with points to both Adam and Emily and back again before touching each of the anchors as one, two. After a four second lapse, Tanya explicitly asks Adam, who is his paternal grandmother? And her eye gaze locks onto Adam, designating him as the targeted recipient of the second person possessive pronoun, Nini. At line 14, Emily prompts Tanya to ask, ask her, Naika, ask me, which it, she does at line 17 uh, with the same question, uh, but this time her, shifting her gaze in the direction of Emily. At line 19, Emily provides the name of her father's mother, Belinda, 
Then at line 21, Tanya gazes around to look for the bird, pointing out that Belinda's totem, the red-tailed black cockatoo, is around. She then prompts Adam to provide his mucker's name, which had already been mentioned, incidentally, by Penelope. And at line 20, oops, line 23, I've lost the notes. No. Line 23, she also asks Adam what his mucker's name is. At line 27, Penelope adds that Emily had just said her name, and in the same breath, she says, what's your mucker's name? It's Emily that provides the answer, and the further prompt at line 31 is unsuccessful, so the sequence expires. There's a lot going on here. Birds are being equated with grandmothers, two types of merger going on. These mothers are not exactly dumbing things down for the kids. But there are hooks to learning that are surely helpful. Points and eye gaze, which is effectively a type of point, uh, is used to map kin terms onto the participation frame. The target of the point becomes the anchor of the kin term. And even touch is used to unpack the sibling inflected dual pronoun. Quite how much of this Adams understands is debatable, but even if he hasn't internalized it all now, he does have some useful data points that connect his genealogy to Emily's genealogy, especially through the magical merging of the two grandmothers, Belinda and Wendy, as a single bird singing out from a tree. This is rich, deeply enculturated social learning, and evidently it starts very young. And as these concrete examples set the scene for the sort of abstract system level cognition required to navigate one's way through the jungle of what is interconnected genealogies. So both the LAMP data and the experimental data show that very young children understand who their close kin are, but uh, as distance gets larger, um, this accuracy definitely drops off. Uh, Misfires as genealogical distance expands suggest the rudiments of the classificatory system are in place whereby the relationships to socially salient kin are rote learned, but the broader categories and the mechanisms required to expand these out from salient prototypes are not yet in place. Prompting routines enter a referential frame of imagined reported dialogue in which child anchored kin terms are mapped onto the child's relatives who are usually mentioned by a name. Very young children are explicitly taught what to call various relatives and are implicitly instructed about the categorical equivalents of, and, and structural mergers. We don't see explicit explanation of the mechanisms of merger, but we do see children being provided with lots of data points, which are nodes within their own genealogies, as well as nodes within other kids' genealogies. And the incorporation of totems into the kinship structure helps kids to entertain abstract thinking by broadening out the kinship domain from a purely genealogical basis. Thank you to various people. There's a few references there for you.